and welcome to the GAR Hall Special Event Zoom Edition. Um, we've been having a great run here. We've had so many great uh, presenters from all over the country. And now we've got a, another great presenter we're very excited to have with a, a story with a, quite a local twist to it. And I think you're all going to enjoy it. Um, just a couple of things that I have coming up. Our next presentation, which is on the 15th, is um, uh, Jeff Belanger. Some of you might know him from Ghost Hunters and from New England Legends on PBS. He recently climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and he's written a book and he's going to talk all about his adventures. Um, then we have got two programs in May, which will relate to the Underground Railroad. We've got the Boston Maritime Underground Railroad, and then we've got the Women in um, Boston Underground Railroad. And those are gonna be by um, both National Park Service Rangers are going to be giving those talks. We'll be talking about the Red Sox in June, and then we're just not sure what's gonna happen after that. We're not sure if we're gonna go back live, we're gonna keep the Zoom, it's all, depending on what the governor tells us we can do. So we thank you all for being here. As always, there is no charge. There's no fee to attend our programs. The more the merrier. But if you feel so inclined, we certainly would not say no to your donations. So I will put up a PayPal link you can take a look at. And if you'd like to send something in, we'd appreciate it. But now, Without further ado, as they say, I'd like to introduce Andrew Noon. He is a educator. He's a um, K through six, I believe, music teacher in the Worcester Public Schools. And he is a very recently published author, very excited. At the end, we'll have the Q&A and he'll give you the information on how you can get his book if you'd like that. So what's gonna happen is I'm going to be sharing my screen and doing the slide presentation along with his, um, his talk. My presentation will be in three sections. I'll begin with a synopsis of the book, then uh, a brief bio of uh, Sitchwood's star citizen, William Cushing, and his relationship to the uh, story. And then I'll close with um, uh, some details about the um, legal aspects of the case. Uh, Bathsheba Spooner was the next to last of seven children born to Timothy Ruggles and Bathsheba born Newcomb. Mrs. Ruggles had birthed eight children from her first marriage. Her mother's roots were firmly planted in one of Cape Cod's oldest families, her father's from Roxbury. He was born in 1711, descendant of a family long involved in Massachusetts politics, but not enjoyed the status to which he would rise. A brigadier general in the French and Indian, Indian War, he had also served as Speaker of the House for two years. His reputation suffered dramatically when, as delegate to the Stamp Act Congress of 1765 in New York, he refused to join those protesting the actions of Parliament and King George III. Now firmly placed in the camp of those loyal to the King, he freely accepted the position of Mandamus Counselor, one of the men who were appointed by the King's Governor to the Upper Massachusetts House to do the King's bidding. Few men were as loathed in Massachusetts in the year 1774. That year, he was banished from his new hometown of Hardwick. Uh, if we see um, slide number one, uh, rather two, rather, Timothy. So here's Timothy Ruggles. And it's in our slide three is Rochester uh, from uh, the 1890s. Slide three, next slide. This is Hardwick. Hardwick is north uh, western Worcester County. So he's banished to Hardwick, which was the town his ancestors had founded and he himself nurtured. He remained in British-controlled Boston until Evacuation Day, March 17, 1776, when he was removed with most Tories to Staten Island. In the next slide. This is a British uh, map uh, from the late 18th century of Staten Island. In the meantime, daughter Bathsheba had married Joshua Spooner of Boston, a businessman slash land speculator slash lumber salesman. The couple settled in Brookfield. Next slide. This is the Oliver Crosby House in Brookfield from 1797, so a generation after Bathsheba. Uh, this home actually uh, is directly across the street from the inn, uh, which was the last place really that Joshua Spooner saw alive. So my back is to the inn where he had his last meal. Uh, 
Um, the couple again settled in Brookfield, not far from nearby Hardwick, where her father was living. The marriage may have been an arranged one, a marriage which gossipers usually characterized as inharmonious. 16-year-old militiaman Ezra Ross of Topsfield. Next slide. Here's Topsfield. He was a native of Ipswich, left his hospital camp in 1777 in Peekskill, New York, to venture home. Peekskill is just a few miles north of uh, New York City. En route, he was taken in by Bathsheba in Brookfield and nursed back to health. He returned to Topsfield, then headed west again that fall to join what would become the Battle of Saratoga. The British had hoped to cut New England off from the remaining nine colonies. General Burgoyne's troops heading south to meet up with General Howe's troops heading north. It was not to be. Howe instead focused on Philadelphia, leaving Burgoyne to fend off the increasing masses of American troops north of Albany. The next slide. This is the Battle of Saratoga by John Trumbull. The original is in the uh, Yale University Art Gallery. Uh, the more famous copy is in the uh, rotunda in uh, Congress. Uh, his entire army surrendered to the American General Gates at Saratoga. March to Boston, the British POWs were quartered in Cambridge and Charlestown. Both Sergeant James Buchanan and Private William Brooks managed to escape, not a difficult task, and likely met each other in Worcester for the first time. Now February 1778, the men were apparently headed to Springfield for work when during a fierce snowstorm, they were called into the Spooner home. They remained there for the next few weeks, Bathsheba plotting her husband's murder with them. In the meantime, young Ezra Ross, just having attempted to poison Mr. Spooner, left with him to prepare his Princeton property. Next slide. And here's Princeton's, a 1900 shot. Uh, Princeton's just 10 miles north of Worcester. Uh, the property which was soon to be handed over to his brother. Ross never made it to Princeton, apparently, borrowing Spooner's horse to return to Tossfield. So uh, Bathsheba, uh, Ross, and the two British soldiers all rendezvoused in Brooksfield the evening of March 1st, 1778. It is unclear if their meeting was coincidental or arranged. Having dined with a friend and his wife, Joshua returned home alone through the snow and was assaulted at his well, beaten to death, and thrown in while his wife finished eating her dinner. The clothes he wore and those from his chamber, along with his cash, were distributed among the three men who fled on horseback and foot. All were arrested the next day. The trial took place in late April. Abraham Lincoln's distant cousin as defense attorney, Robert Tree Payne, a signer of the declaration as prosecutor, in a trial organized by Governor John Hancock. Uh, the next slide. This is the second Worcester County Courthouse uh, where the indictment took place. Uh, the plan was for the um, trial to also occur here, here rather, but because so many turned out for the indictment, uh, they realized there would be no room for the even bigger crowd at the trial to follow. So it was moved down the street at the uh, meeting house. Okay. A little bit about the history of this building. This is probably Worcester's most historic building. Uh, the Spooner case took, took place here. Uh, remember, the Spooner case is the country's first capital case. It's the first um, case uh, which resulted in the death of a woman being hanged in America, in the United States, following the Declaration. Uh, this was also the scene of uh, the Quark Walker state, uh, case, actually two cases. Quark Walker was a slave from Brookfield, coincidentally the same town as Bathsheba, who tried to escape from his master in the 17, early 1780s. His master beat him during the escape. Walker sued uh, the master for um, assault. He won that case, and then the, his attorney, who was also Bathsheba's attorney, Levi Lincoln, suggested, why not turn this into an anti-slavery case? It became that. And uh, essentially, the, the second Worcester case ended slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, also in 1774, the Worcester um, Patriots took over the courthouse and forced the British judges out of the courthouse. Uh, Ray Raphael, a, a California historian, claims that this was really the beginning of the American Revolution. Yes, the first battle was conquered in Lexington but the first uh, uh, legal uh, ousting of uh, British officials took place in Worcester. And finally, in 1788, Shays' Rebellion took place here, along with uh, events in Springfield, Taunton, um, and Concord, and I'm forgetting, uh, that's the Walsh and other town. Okay. Um, okay. With a trial lasting just over a day plus, 
All were found guilty. The date of execution was originally set for early June, but the four received a stay until July 2nd. Bathsheba claimed pregnancy. The officials in Boston allowed an exam to be done, proving that she was not with child. She insisted. A second exam not authorized instead confirmed her pregnancy, but the Boston authorities would not relent. Despite an informal third exam proving her right, her execution date was not changed. All four were hanged July 2nd. An autopsy requested by Bathsheba confirmed her pregnancy of five months with a male child. Timothy Ruggles eventually found his way to Nova Scotia, where as a loyal servant to the crown, he was granted a multi-hundred acre estate, which he fostered as he had his legendary estate in Hardwick. His wife chose to stay behind in Massachusetts with their son. He died in 1795. To this day, the burial site in Green Hill Park, next slide, of Bathsheba and her unborn son has never been located. Uh, several sites have been suggested, but over the past nearly 250 years, no one's discovered where it was, where she was buried. Uh, to my back in the scene is where the um, family estate stood. Uh, it was found in 1754 by the late 1800s had 60 rooms. This, uh, the estate survived until 1957 when it was set on fire and unfortunately it was taken down then. Um, in uh, the year, I think it was 2000, uh, what turned out to be the largest estate sale in Massachusetts history was the Green Estate, that the family had accumulated over 150 years in this, in this huge home of all these items. It took, I think, three weeks to sell off all the items. Um, okay, so that's essentially a synopsis. Moving on to our star, Situate Citizen. Uh, son of a state associate justice, William Cushing was born in 1732. On the next slide. As far as I know, this is uh, the only somewhat true to life image we have of, of Cushing. So he's born the same year as Washington, okay? Three years younger than John Adams, like Adams and Worcester, Cushing began his career as a school teacher in Roxbury. Legal competition was fierce and situate, so Cushing moved to Palmerboro, Maine, the first trained lawyer in the county, only 28 years of age. His income came largely from suits involving maritime commerce, from lending money, and then suing for collection. He refused an appointment from George III. In 1772, he succeeded his father as a justice to the Superior Court, where he served for five years. John Adams resigned as Chief Justice, Cushing taking up the post in 1777. He served a 12-year term, overseeing both of the Quack Walker cases in Worcester, which effectively ended slavery in Massachusetts, and was admired for his cool head during Shays' Rebellion, the first revolt against the US government. He was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, serving from 1790 until 1810. For one week, while the search was on for a candidate to fill the seat, Cushing served as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, following the legendary John Jay. Cushing administered the oath of office to Washington at his second inauguration. Next slide. Okay. Uh, again, here's Washington's second inauguration. Uh, by uh, an artist named Baffin, uh, obviously Washington the center uh, left there. And Cushing, I believe, is um, uh, center right, the, ma the main judge you see there to the right. Okay. One day in New York, again, New York was one of our original capitals, while sporting his judicial wig, a British affectation, a boy shouted, my eye, what a wig. Cushing never wore one again making him the last American judge to sport one. As a jurist, he was noted for his calm, deliberate manner. With him in Washington at the same time was Levi Lincoln, the Worcester attorney who represented the Spooner defendants and now attorney general under Jefferson. Cushing died in 1810 and is buried in Situate's Cushing Memorial State Park. Next slide. Considered as Situate's most illustrious citizen, even over Jim Lonborg. I didn't realize Jim Lonborg was from Sichuan. The star, the ace uh, pitcher of the Dream Team 67. Um, American jurisprudence, like American society itself, was undergoing a period of rapid transition during the revolution, though changes were slower to come in the courtroom. Earlier 17th century law defined itself within the confines of the Bible. Mosaic law was viewed as comparable to natural law and the latter became the basis for defining criminal laws in the 18th century. Trials for capital crimes in colonial Massachusetts typically lasted only a day. In some ways, they were conducted as open debates, 
anyone in attendance could comment on the proceedings. A jury of peers had been guaranteed by the First Continental Congress in 1774. And this was following uh, British tradition, new recent British tradition. In the case of Bathsheba and her three men, it is fair to say that the recommendation could not be followed. All the jurors were male and likely all moderate or radical patriots. No law school existed until 1784. Uh, the next slide. This is the Tapping Reeve Law School in Litchfield, Connecticut, which was the country's first against uh, it dates from uh, 1784. Prior to that, attorneys were trained as apprentices. Law books and reports were at a premium. Most training involved tedious copying of writs. Criminal cases such as the Spooner case were rare. Few attorneys had any such experience. Unlike today's role more as advocate, the 18th century attorney's function was more that of advisor. Unlike British courts, the defense counsel was allowed to craft a potentially decisive closing argument for his clients, which Lincoln did to no avail. Convicts had no right to an appeal unless such laws were instituted in 1780, rather until such laws were instituted in 1789. In the case of the Spoonish trial, it appears that Levi Lincoln only had a few days in which to prepare his case. Although he may have begun doing some research the week following the murder in early March, it is likely that most of his preparation took place between the indictments of April 21st and the trial three days later. Uh, the next slide. Okay. Uh, this is a slide of Levi Lincoln, who was uh, Bathsheba's defense attorney. Next slide. Again, here's the second Worcester County Courthouse. We already saw where the indictments took place. Uh, the building is not in its original location. It was originally at Lincoln Square in Worcester, where all the courthouses ex existed right through the um, right through 19, actually 2000. In 2000, a new courthouse was built uh, a little bit down Main Street, but uh, the buildings from 1840s, 1870s, and 1890s still stand at Lincoln Square. This building was there prior to those. Okay, it was moved around uh, 1800 when uh, the new courthouse was built by Charles Bullfinch. And then it was dismantled again around 1895 and um, shipped to the west side of the city in a new neighborhood uh, for the city's elites called Maycroft Heights. It was placed where it currently is. In such a brief window, uh, Lincoln had to work through a complex set of circumstances. Four defendants, one murderer, three accomplices, one of those accomplices not engaged in the actual murder. Two were American, two British, one was a woman from the elite and three were soldiers. One was only 17 years old. It remained unclear if he, was if he was aware of the final plot prior to the evening of the murder. The jury was likely almost exclusively made up of patriots. Uh, next slide. So to the right is the Worcester County, uh, the Worcester, yeah, Worcester, no, I'm sorry, Worcester Meeting House, uh, which is now where Worcester City Hall stands. To the left is the Old Town Hall. Uh, this is an 1890s, uh, yeah, about an 1890s slide, uh, courtesy of the Worcester Historical Society. Uh, the building on the right, again, was very much altered since the um, 1763 uh, building. So this is as it appeared in 1890. Both of these buildings were knocked down in 1896 for the new city hall. Um, again, the justices themselves were patriots. Okay. Uh, the, the instigator, Bathsheba, did not seem to be of sound mind, a defense which would have had little precedence in 1778. Um, Levi Lincoln made some attempts to present that as a defense, but it really didn't go very far. Lincoln was only 29 years old. This was his first capital case. Sentencing prisoners uh, to life terms did not occur until later in the next century. Capital crimes demanded capital punishments. Uh, the next slide. This is Union Station in Worcester, 1912. I was restored in 2000. This is the location of uh, the, um, uh, gall uh, the gallows where they were all executed. So um, to my uh, right, about eh, probably a thousand feet maybe, is City Hall, so where the meeting house was. Okay. Uh, incarceration, again, was largely a 19th century development. Culprits spending time in jail in the 18th century were usually there because of an inability to pay debts or to await trial, as in the case of the Spooner defendants. In the next slide. 
And here's the current slide of Green Hill Park. Again, no one knows where she's buried, but um, the Green Estate is to my left, probably. Yeah, probably 2,000 feet to my left. Okay. I wanted to close by doing just a short reading, a two-page reading of the murder night, just prior to the murder. So jo jo um, Joshua Spooner is having dinner in the center of town. Bathsheba, the two British soldiers, and uh, the young American soldier, Ezra, have all gathered in Brookfield at the home. A lookout was set up by the parlor door window, as Joshua was expected at any time. Bathsheba called into the kitchen for some supper for the men. Brooks and Buchanan took a seat near Ross, helping themselves to a bowl of flip. A few minutes later, Mrs. Stratton, the housekeeper, brought them dinner. At the center of town, Joshua was passing the evening amiably. He was, in the words of innkeeper Ephraim Cooley, pleasant and sociable, sharing a glass of rum with Dr. King and his wife after dinner. Dr. King testified that Spooner departed at the same time as he and his wife, well between eight and nine o'clock. The Kings, however, they were traveling, unfortunately did not offer to accompany Spooner home. At the Spooners, according to the testimony of Sarah Stratton, Bathsheba took her dinner in the kitchen with a Mr. Gray and his partner. Men further identified simply as two boarders. Mysteriously, outside of the few mentions they receive in the housekeeper's testimony, their names never reappear. Spooner, in high and possibly intoxicated spirits, left uh, Cooley's with no reason to suspect that this would be his final walk. As he had banished Buchanan and Brooks from his home two weeks earlier, he did not expect to see them ever again. He had also bid farewell to Ross at about the same time. Further, Spooner had never given any indication that he believed his wife wished him dead. The night was cold. Although only a short distance from his home, Spooner may have wished he had taken his horse. If he had, his evening might have turned out very differently. One of the conspirators saw Joshua approach. Brooks left the parlor to stand within what was referred to as the small gate, leaving the entryway, which led into the kitchen. Before leaving the room, he picked up a foot-long log from the hearth. Joshua approached, the crunching snow the only sound disturbing the silence. Bathsheba remained in the kitchen, her children asleep by the fire. It was just before nine o'clock. As Buchanan later wrote, and then was the time for the devil to show his power over them who had forsaken God. Leave you tantalizingly at that moment. Uh, the next slide. This is the Brookfield Inn where Joshua had his, possibly is the Brookfield Inn. We don't know that. Uh, it's the only surviving inn in the Brookfield Center. It uh, dates from 1768. I've not been able to determine if this is the, the end, but very possibly is. And the next slide. And this is the, um, again, the marker at the murder site, which is just a third of a mile north from the building you just saw. So we walked about a third of a mile home. This was erected in the 1970s. Does anybody have any questions? Anyone? Any? Oh. We've got to unmute you, don't we? Everyone now has the ability to unmute if they so wish. Okay, thank you, Seth. So if you'd like to unmute yourselves and ask a question, please go right ahead. Yeah, Andrew, uh, this is Brett. I was wondering if you could talk about the research process and how long it took you. Sure. I really started with, at the American Antiquarian Society in Worcester. Uh, that was my, really my home base over the years. Um, it took uh, six, seven years of research. Uh, I also took in a lot of uh, local libraries, uh, Massachusetts Historical Society, the Genealogical Society, uh, Worcester Historical, um, some college libraries. But I'd say 80% of the research was at the Antiquarian Society. Thank you. Sure. Andrew, uh, yes. Bob Chessian, are you aware that we have Chief Justice Cushing Shea at our historical, one of our historical buildings? I'm, I'm sorry, am I aware that what? Chief Justice Cushing Shea, what he would ride around in when he went on his trips. We have that and it's in excellent condition. It's been restored. Oh, wow. It's exciting. Nice. It's, it's in our uh, carriage house at the Cudworth House, along with uh, the coach that Lafayette wrote in when he came back for his victory tour. Well, wow. come down and see us sometime. 
Yeah, sure. What happened to uh, Cushing's home? Uh, that, it, um, I'm trying to think. I think it's up by the cemetery. I'm Still sure. there, okay. Very good. Anyone else? Any questions? Yes, Jody, I see. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, those uh, illustrations are in the book, two of them. In, in case you don't know, uh, Lucy um, uh, McDonald was a girlfriend of Ezra Ross from Ipswich, and she uh, came to um, West Boylston to say uh, an in to uh, take in the proceedings of the trial in execution. And while she was there, she notched the, the wall upstairs bolt with the chalk uh, for each day she stayed there. And if you count them back from the execution day, July 2nd, it goes to the uh, indictment date. So it's, it's proof that she stayed there the entire time. But she did uh, three or four drawings of, uh, of chalk drawings of the execution of Bathsheba and the, the prisoners. They weren't discovered until the 1980s. <clears throat> Anyone hi, else? Andrew. I was wondering, hi, this is Robin. Um, Hello, Robin. I was wondering uh, how you chose this subject. Sure. Uh, when we moved here in the late 1990s, a friend came to dinner and reminded me that across the street is where Bathsheba was buried. And I'd heard the story, and I was curious to read up on it, and found nothing but uh, the most extensive treatment was the treatment by an attorney in the 1840s. And he gave maybe 20 pages to it. So I said, this needs a serious study. Halfway through my research, uh, Deborah Navis's book came out in 1999, kind of threw me for a loop, uh, but I said, I need to put a this. So I, my, I went a different direction. Mine's more of a scholarly narrative. Hers is more of a, a tight, kind of uh, closely researched bit by bit. I, I wanted more of an overviewing, overarching view of, of the um, uh, story with, with a scholarly background. So it's two very different books. Oh, neat. Thank you. And Andrew, can you tell us how um, the viewers could get the copy of this book? Or sure. do you autograph them and send them out? Or how does yeah, it work? Yeah, that's an awkward. It, yeah, it's available at uh, Amazon Books. Uh, you just type in the title. I've discovered that putting my name in sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. The title works better. Uh, it's available as an ebook or paperback. Um, yeah, the question is how do I sign Amazon books? No one has the answer to that question yet. I don't know. I will have a signing in Worcester where people will bring books they've bought. I, I will sign them there. I may have a few copies available at the time also uh, to be signed. But it's a good question. If you order directly from Amazon, yeah, really, there's no need for me to sign them at that point. Great. Anybody else? Well, it looks like Lucille, did you have a question? I do. Oh, okay. Who is that? I'm Jody. Hi, jo um, just hi. Uh, thanks for answering the other question about Bathsheba and West Boylston. I live in West Boylston, but I come to Situate in the summer. Okay. Um, do you uh, do you have a new topic that you're planning to research and write about? Yeah, I'd rather say what it will be a Worcester topic that had national significance, but I don't want to say. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> we'll have to wait for that, huh? <laughs> Very fascinating talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Fascinating story. It was interesting. Thank you very much. Sure. And how old did you say she was? I'm sorry, Andrew. When she, when she was executed? Yes. 32. Whoa. 32? Yeah. Okay. Whoa. Husband, husband was 37. Whoa. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Who was that? My beagle. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I'll mute. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, 
I think we will probably, you know, close for the evening unless anybody else. No, I guess we're all set. Well, I, I had a question. How do we join the Historical Society? You can. Bobby, is it up on the website yet? Um, the website is not quite up yet. But, um, is it on the old website? Uh, it should be, yeah. Okay, if, if you can't find it on the website, email me at garhallevents at okay. gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And I'll be sure that you get all the information that you need. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. And if anybody wants to get on the mailing list, you can email me at that address as well. I'll get you on the mailing list and you'll get all the information on all the upcoming programs um, and other things that we're doing at the Society. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah. Well, right now, because of the pandemic, we're kind of in a limbo. <laughs> right. Just like everybody else, huh? Unfortunately. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. Thank you, and good luck with your new book. Um, yes. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Yep, and if you can keep in touch with me, maybe, let me know things that are going on. I can put that out on our page and let, you know, our members know what you've got, you know, coming up when you decide to reveal what this new book is going to be. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for putting this together. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night.